The title of today's lesson is Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. It is taken from Psalm 139, which is a very uh, well-known passage. Uh, now, the title is uh, not terribly descriptive, but we are going to talk about something that's, that's very important in today's society, and that is the topic of abortion. It's a very difficult topic and a very sensitive topic uh, in our world right now. And what I'm going to do is, as I was kind of putting everything together, there's all different kinds of ways you could, you could address this topic. And uh, some things that I think are maybe less helpful, um, statistics and things like that, uh, I think are good supplementary things, you know, uh, psychological reviews of, of what goes on in, in terms of the biology and psychology and even um, philosophy. I mean, philosophy even comes to bear on this, on this topic. But uh, what we're going we're gonna to do this morning is we're going to stick pretty much with what the Bible has to say about personhood and the life of people at all ages. So uh, I did want to start with just a couple of, a couple of uh, uh, st statistical things. Um, in 2017, there were uh, an estimated... 800,000, 860,000 abortions performed. And if we were to uh, look at the trend of this, it seems to be going down. Um, there seems to be fewer being performed, but it's still in the, uh, I think the 600s is where it is per year uh, in America, even though it is, it is decreasing somewhat. In the United States, of course, you may know this figure, 60 million abortions since Roe v. Wade in 1973. And to kind of put this into a, a kind of a context, you know, sometimes we throw around numbers like billions and trillions and, you know, whatever. Um, it, it doesn't really mean very much, right? It's, oh, well, that's a big number with lots of zeros. And, and you don't quite uh, grasp the magnitude of what that number is. If we were to take everyone just in the, in the United States who has been aborted, in uh, the last few decades and uh, put them together, uh, if you look at the list of the populations of the world, 60 million would be right about number 23. All the people who have been aborted just in the United States that we know of um, in the last, you know, uh, 40, 50 years would make the 23rd most populous country in the world. If you were to take the number of abortions performed worldwide in just one year, it's 42 million. Just all the abortions in one year performed worldwide, you would have it somewhere around number 36. The number of people aborted every year would make the 36th most populous nation on the face of the planet. Now the question is, what do we make of these numbers? These are some big numbers, right? So what do we make of them? Is this a triumph for women's reproductive health care, or is it a holocaust? Or something in between, right? What is it exactly? Well, we're going to look at that issue from what the Bible has to say about it. You know, again, we could look at it from a variety of different angles, but what I want to do is stick with what the Bible says. What, what does Scripture say about the, the life of the individual uh, from, you know, the womb uh, on? Womb to the tomb, right? Sometimes it's said. Well, first of all, let's look at the question, does the Bible call the unborn a person? Does the Bible refer to unborn individuals as people? And here I think it's incredibly important to understand that terminology makes a difference because what you have very often is, those, and I'm not trying to demonize. I want that to be incredibly clear when I say this. I'm not trying to demonize anyone at any point, at any time. But very often what I see for those who are pro-choice or pro-abortion is that there is a, uh, at least a tendency, if not a full-on aversion, to referring to the unborn as a person. The term child, uh, I don't hear it being used very often. The term baby, right? These are emotionally connected terms. Uh, they don't seem to refer to the unborn as that. They refer to the unborn as a fetus. Now, to be fair, fetus is the clinical term for a person at this stage in development. Uh, after conception, 
Uh, that's what they are. They are a fetus. That is the nomenclature that medical health care professionals have chosen to describe a person at that stage of development. So that's accurate. However, it's also more than that. It's more than just a fetus, right? It's a person. And I think here we see the tactical use of language. Terms like child and baby are avoided. And we also see a uh, an opposition, sometimes a very vehement opposition, to having a mother who may be considering having an abortion, to having a mother hear the child's heartbeat or see the child on an ultrasound, right? Because once you do that, once you hear the heartbeat, once you, once you see the feet and the hands and the movements, it becomes real. Because it seems like a real person, a little person in there, right? Well, I think that a lot of people don't even really know what abortion does. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. That's, uh, that's pretty gruesome. And, uh, but the fact is, a lot of people don't know what it is. It's, it's kind of like you have a condition. Right? You, go, you have a condition. You go to the doctor. And once you leave, you don't have that condition anymore. And that's kind of how some people seem to view pregnancy. When uh, uh, I read a story several years ago about, uh, it was written by a very, very pro-choice um, abortion clinic nurse. She said she remembered there was a time when uh, there was a woman who, who came in, and she came in a number of times. I think she said this, this one day, it was, this was like her ninth time uh, in, the, in the clinic. And you know, she was kind of joking and laughing about everything, came in for an abortion. And uh, this kind of irritated this nurse. Now, again, she was full-on pro-choice. But it sort of, she said it irritated her that this lady was basically coming in and using abortion as her own personal birth control, taxpayer funded. And she made the decision that she was going to show the woman the body of the child after everything was finished. And this lady was, had, 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 been, had been laughing and joking, and then she saw this little body and silence. She was stunned, shocked. Her boyfriend was there, same thing. No more laughter. In fact, they both left without saying a single word. And the nurse said she never saw them again. Because at that moment, it had become real for them. That, was a li- that wasn't just a condition. It wasn't just a fetus. It was actually a baby. It was a person. I think that's part of the problem because we look at this procedure and it's a sterile medical procedure. It's not the death of, of something. And you, you don't get into this, this dismemberment it's a terrible word, um, but that's what it is uh, in, in, in many, of these, many of these cases. Well, the details that I'm not going to go into are in, uh, the ones we're going to look at are, are in Scripture. And I think if we look at the grand scope of things and the Bible verses we'll be looking at, we will see that the Bible very clearly identifies the unborn as a person. It's not just a fetus. It's not uh, just a thing. It's not just a condition. It is a life that has been handcrafted by God and designed for beautiful things. Psalm 139, verses 12 to 14. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, I want to look at a couple of verses quickly, and I don't want to overstate the case. Okay, This is done on both sides. Uh, Some people try to shoehorn the Bible into really coming down hard on the issue. Some people try to do the same thing and, and twist scripture to permit every, basically everything that goes on uh, dealing with this topic. Uh, and I read an a, a, a article by a fellow who wrote something for Planned Parenthood just, just yesterday where he went through 10 Bible verses that supposedly pr- pr- permit abortion. And I can honestly say uh, I've never read a more 
incomprehensibly ridiculous twisting of the Bible than what this guy wrote. Uh, he had no credentials that I, that I knew. He was a humanist minister, whatever that is. Uh, that, was the, that was the extent of his credentials. But we're going to actually look at the text and, and dig into the text. Some of the same ones that he brought up. Well, we have to be careful here, right? So David is, seems to be saying, what he seems to be implying here is that he has personhood and identity in the womb. This is at the very core of what makes a human being a human being, right? Personhood, identity, that's what, we, that's, that's what separates us from animals or from anything else, right? Identity, personhood, uh, and this sort of thing. This was what David seems to be implying is here in the womb. Jeremiah 1 7 seems to have the same thing Before I formed you in the womb. I knew you and before you were born. I consecrated you I appointed you as a prophet to the nations now again. This is a man whose identity is known before his conception Before during and after the whole conception to birth process God knows who Jeremiah is at each point, he has this plan in mind for what he wants this man to do when he becomes a prophet and answers his calling by God. This was not something that Jeremiah earned later. This was not some kind of promotion that he got or he made himself available or it was some decision that God made after the fact. This was something that God had designed before Jeremiah was even conceived and had his identity and personhood in mind throughout that process all the way through his life. Now, in looking at the New Testament, there's a very, very important word in the New Testament. That's the word brephos, and that is a word that covers a variety of different stages of a child's development. The New Testament does not make a distinction anywhere from the unborn all the way up through a small child who is at the age where they can go to school. It is all the same word in Greek. Now, this is what linguists call a semantic range okay we're going to look at this range of uses in the new testament so luke 1 41 and when elizabeth heard the greeting of mary the baby leaped in her womb and elizabeth was filled with the holy spirit all right so luke 1 41 you have an unborn child an unborn baby luke 2 12 the announcement, for unto you this is, is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger, clearly referring to a newborn. 1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, clearly referring to a nursing infant. Luke 18, 15. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. This is clearly an infant. It could be somebody all the way up to the age of a toddler that's being brought to Jesus. And then 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 15. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. That is the, the Old Testament, essentially which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Here it's referring to a child who has some kind of cognitive ability, is able to learn and memorize scripture, is possibly at the age where they can go to school. The same word is applied to all of these, this entire age range, from the unborn to a, to a, school, a, a child of school age. So the point here is, is what we're doing is we're, we're showing that the New Testament does not make a distinction here because very often what pro-abortion advocates do is they do want to make this distinction. The unborn child is a fetus. The newly born child is a person, legally speaking, right? That's how, that's how the laws in America work uh, right now. And so this is making a distinction that the New Testament does not make. The New Testament clearly refers to the unborn all the way up through small children with the same word. Now. Another question is, does the Bible mention abortion? And here we have to say that no, it does not. It does not have uh, any references to this uh, from what I can tell. It, neither Greek nor Hebrew have a word for the practice that's at least used in scripture. Now, what we do see is that the Bible does refer to the unborn and in one place does so, it, to me, very clearly, very clearly, 
uh, with a, uh, a connection to this issue. And the verse that we're going to be talking about is Exodus 21, verses 22 to 23. Now, abortion advocates will say this passage is only talking about a miscarriage. So here's what it says. When, sorry that the text is a bit small on the screen there. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. All right. Well, this is the golden text for abortion advocates who will say that what's being spoken of here is a miscarriage. So the woman is getting in between two men who are fighting. That's a bad idea. <laughs> trying to get in between two wild dogs, right? You don't do that. Uh, but she tries to get in between these two guys. Maybe she gets hit or bumped or she is, is, is hurled into something or something happens. And she goes into some kind of premature delivery and everything, you know, everything happens. But whatever it is, it's just a, a miscarriage. And so the guy who's responsible pays a fine because otherwise if it was a person, then they would put him to death, right? So you just pay a fine because it's just a miscarriage. Well, some translations do actually translate it that way. Uh, the Revised Standard Version and New Revised Standard Versions, uh, which are versions that I like very much actually. Arguably, they're some of the most scholarly versions that are out there. They get it dead wrong in this translation. They call this a miscarriage. That is not the word that is used. Hebrew has a word for miscarriage. It doesn't appear in this text. All right, so this is what the text says. Uh, you, this, these two guys are fighting. This woman is, is, is jostled or bummed or pushed or something hit, and she goes into premature, uh, premature labor and delivery. Well, it is unlikely that what's being spoken of here, and now this was, this was surely an actual example of something that really happened because many biblical laws in the Mosaic Covenant are very much like this. There's something that actually happened. It's something that actually occurred. And so that's why they're in the, the Mosaic Law because it's an actual example of something that did happen. Okay? This is, it is less believable that this woman dies than she falls or stumbles and and then goes into premature labor. Um, that kind of thing happens, right? Uh, 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 my own sister, who, uh, was she, when she was pregnant with her first child, was out at my parents' house, and, and on our patio and our, our driveway, there's a little bit of a drop, about three or four inches. And my sister uh, just happened to, to stumble, uh, or something, something tripped or, or something, and she fell down face first hard on this paved driveway. Uh, very soon she went into premature labor and had my niece about a month early. And so this kind of thing does happen. Well, there are four points I wanna make about the language here that we see in this passage. And so we look at the word for to come out. Uh, the word yetza, it means here, it seems premature birth. It does not specify that the child is alive or dead. It just says the child comes out. The child is some kind of delivery, right? Secondly, Hebrew has a term for miscarriage, shakal. That is not the word that is used here. Now, this word does appear other places. It appears maybe half a dozen times or so in the Old Testament. This is not one of them. The word for harm, a sown, means harm or injury, but it is specifically something that is catastrophic and virtually always leads to death. Okay, so the harm being spoken of here is something that leads to death. And then finally, we want to point out that Hebrew has no word for fetus, just like Greek. There is no special word for unborn. It is the term for child, yelled, that's used here. Uh, that can mean anything from an unborn child all the way up through a, a you know, a small child, uh, you know, uh, almost, you know, young adult. So, uh, what we see here is that this passage is not just simply talking about a miscarriage. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back and look at the passage again and taking all of the language into account 
we're going we're gonna to look at it and kind of do the, um, what I call the, the BPV, the Bryant paraphrase version, all right? So, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that she goes into premature labor, but there is no harm, there is no death of anyone involved, by the way, the, uh, the language here is not specific to the mother. It's deliberately ambiguous. It's deliberately ambiguous. So that, her, so that she goes into premature labor, but there is no harm to anyone involved. The one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and, as, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, something that leads to death, some kind of catastrophic injury, again, ambiguous, it doesn't specify the mother. So it leads us to conclude it's either mother or child. Either mother or child suffers harm, then you shall pay life for life. The text seems to be very clear here. Two guys are fighting, woman gets in between them, she is bumped, knocked down, hit, she goes into premature labor. If the child comes out and is fine, the man only pays a fine. If the child comes out and is not of sufficient age to be able to make it on its own and dies, the man's put to death. This seems to be very clear, very clearly expressing the value of the unborn even if it does not talk about or condemn abortion per se. Now, a natural question following that is, well, why doesn't the Bible say more? Why doesn't the Bible say more about this? And I think what we have here is more than enough information to conclude that abortion is wrong. The person in the womb, from the passages that we've looked at, has value, they have personhood, they have identity, and... It, I mean, it says point blank. God has plans for individuals while they are in the womb. He knows who they are. They have an identity before they are born, just as much as they do after. But you're always going to have those who will make the argument, ah, but the Bible never says that it's wrong. I'm going to be honest with you. If the Bible doesn't say it's wrong, is how you choose to make your moral and ethical choices. That is not a mature Christian faith. It may not be Christian faith at all. It may be that you just think the Bible is a really, nice, uh, really neat book that has a really good self-help program, and you subscribe to that. Now, this is where we see some of our uh, politicians sort of camp out. Well, the Bible never condemns it. And, uh, you know, we could, we could give specific examples. I don't want to... I struggle with doing that because I don't want to seem like this is a political thing because it's not a political issue, it is a moral issue, okay? Um, so I'll just say that uh, for some individuals, I remember several years ago there was one, one politician who said, but the church has never been clear on abortion. It's never taken a stand on this, and so I have you know, flexibility. Now she didn't say I have flexibility, but that's clearly what she, what she intended. Now. Um, this particular person claims to be a very faithful member of the Roman Catholic Church. Immediately, she's got some problems because the church has been very clear. The Roman Catholic Church has been very clear in addition to, in addition to the clarity of Scripture on the matter of abortion. And so if you want to go back to, you know, almost 2,000 years ago, you can find voices in the early church who denounced abortion and said that it was nothing short of murder. And so... You look at some of these, um, some of these passages, the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve, uh, early, early second century, some people think maybe even at the end of the first century. You shall not procure an abortion, nor destroy a newborn child. The Epistle of Barnabas, another mm, second century book. Thou shalt not procure abortion, thou shalt not commit infanticide. Using those two things in parallel, it kind of tells you what it is, abortion, infanticide. Same thing, there, there, there's, no, there's no distinction made. Manucius Felix, writing in the third century, says abortion is parasite. Parasite is the murder of a close family relative. He also calls it homicide and says that it comes from pagan religion because Christians are not expected to do this kind of thing. Hippolytus, also third century, calls abortion impiety and murder. Basil the Great says, but the man or woman who is a murderer that gives a philtrum, some kind of you know, potion or something, uh, and if the man takes it that dies upon it, if the man takes it that dies upon it, so if, if they give somebody something to drink and they die, they're a murderer, okay? 
so are they who take medicines to procure abortion. And then finally, Josephus says the law, moreover, now this is an early Jewish interpreter, an early Jewish interpreter of the Mosaic law. The law, moreover, enjoins us to bring up all our offspring and forbids women to cause abortion of what is begotten or to destroy it afterward. And if any woman appears to us so done, she will be a murderer of her child by destroying a living creature and diminishing humankind. And then I'll just add Mother Teresa in here. He doesn't like Mother Teresa, right? I feel that the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion because it is a, it is a war against the child, a direct killing of the innocent child, murder by the mother herself. And if we accept that a mother can kill even her own child, how can we tell other people not to kill each other? At the heart of abortion is the determination of the right to decide who lives and who dies, who is privileged and who isn't. And there are sometimes these kind of outrageous uh, scenarios that are concocted as kind of thought experiments to kind of bring some clarity to the issue or kind of sharpen the lines, if you will. Uh, kind of like this one, it's, it's my favorite. It's, um, you have been kidnapped. Okay, it starts out with your kidnapping. You've been kidnapped. You wake up in a secret hospital. Your, somehow your organs have been connected to another person. This other person needed life-saving surgery. And so you are kidnapped and brought to this facility. You are joined together surgically somehow and you need to remain joined together until this person grows strong enough to, they, to where they can be, be disconnected and then go and, and, and live independently of you. Uh, I'll be honest, uh, I, I am uh, not a fan of that argument because it uh, very clearly is meant to be an analogy to pregnancy. There are a lot of problems with that. I mean, some person, and, and it, apparently intelligent person, you know, is under the mistaken impression that this is actually a good analogy for pregnancy when it is not. But those kinds of, of thought experiments kind of, you know, bring clarity to things. You know, things like if you've ever heard of the, uh, the trolley dilemma, sometimes it's called the bystander at the switch. You know, you're still standing at a, at a, beside a railway and there's a trolley that's broken loose and is, is speeding uncontrolled down the, down the rails and, and you're standing next to a switch and you can see that if, you, if the trolley keeps going, it's going to hit five people and kill them. Or maybe you know, one person, three per, however many. Now you can pull the switch and save those, but it's going to divert the trolley to where it kills this one other person. So what do you do? Do you stand there and do nothing and watch five people die? Or do you essentially murder one person to save the five? Right? And so you have all kinds of experiments like these, these kind of thought experiments to kind of clarify moral decisions and, and, and ethics and that kind of thing. And, uh, and so let's, let's, let's do that this morning. Let's, let's use some examples this morning of, of that same kind of thing. You've got a father who's ill. Mother has tuberculosis. Their children... It's a, it's a sad state because the first child is blind, the second child has already died prematurely, the third is deaf, and the fourth also has tuberculosis. The mother's health is at risk. Family's future is at risk. She's pregnant. Do you keep the baby? Caucasian man rapes a 13-year-old African-American girl. She's pregnant. It's a clear case of rape and an underage mother. You keep the baby. Teenage girl gets pregnant. Very young teenage girl. Her fiance is not the father. She lives in an honor and shame culture where she will be ridiculed for the rest of her life. It may even impact the family's finances because in that kind of culture, it may impact the father's ability to find a job. What do you do? You keep the baby. Well, abortion advocates would say that in every single one of these cases, there is sufficient reason to allow the woman to not only have an abortion, but she should probably be cheered on. She should be celebrated for this choice because what she's doing is she's, she's giving up her child in order to uh, sec secure a, a little bit of extra financial independence for her family, or at least resist financial punishment for her family. Um, she's not going to be mocked and ridiculed. She's not going to be scorned. She's not going to have to live with this, with what's been done to her for her whole life. 
and so they deserve our full support, right? Now you may have already detected that I'm setting you up, and I am, because the first mother, the first family, you know, dad's sick, mom's sick, one of the kids is sick, one's deaf, one's blind. If you kill that baby, you just killed Beethoven. A brilliant musician whose music has brought entertainment and joy to people for hundreds of years. The second case, the young African-American girl, if she has an abortion, she just killed Ethel Waters. The second African-American to be nominated for an Academy Award, the first to star in her own television show, the first to be nominated for a primetime Emmy. These are just a few things in addition to all the other achievements and awards that she was able to accomplish in her lifetime. A woman whose life story is literally a rags to riches tale. And of course, the last one, you probably already know where I'm going with this. It's Jesus, right? The one who brings us life, the one who gave his life for us, the one who teaches us how to treat everyone and lift up those, especially those who need it the most. See, abortion isn't just the death of a fetus. It's the destruction of something beautiful. It's the destruction of something that is handcrafted by God, designed for great things. Now, you might say, Dwayne, you cherry-picked history to find the best examples to prove your point. <laughs> right? You deliberately played on our emotions by choosing these specific examples of great people. And I guess you could say I kind of did. But the real question is, if you're not going to abort them... Why would you roll the dice and abort anyone else? Is it okay to kill a regular person? Take their future away as long as they're not talented? Is it okay to abort someone who is a nobody as long as they don't make some lasting contribution to music and the arts, or film and theater, science? Okay to kill them? Is it okay to kill someone because they're not important or because their family is, is poor or because they have some kind of medical condition? The Bible doesn't see anybody as a nobody. The poor, the sick, these are the very people that Jesus made a point of ministering to in his life. The Bible teaches that we are all valuable regardless of race, color, or national origin. It also says that we are all valuable regardless of our age. Whether we are in the prime of life, or we are in our twilight years, or we've never even seen the world yet because we haven't been born. In God's eyes, all of us are his precious creations. All of us are his handcrafted Masterpieces designed to do the greatest thing in the world, and that is to honor him and to teach other people to go and do likewise.